Since the start of this war, Russia has maintained a handful of advantages over Ukraine, and there's a couple of those that appear to be getting worse. This was outlined in a recent article in RUSI, the Royal United Service Institute, by Dr. Jack Watling, titled, In Ukraine, Russia is Beginning to Compound Advantages. We're going to run through what Dr. Watling lays out here, which is really broken down into the argument around raw numbers and then air defense, as well as what this means on the battlefield going forward and what Ukraine can do to mitigate these disadvantages. Dr. Watling started out by saying, Russia has now started the early phases of its anticipated summer offensive with renewed attacks on Kharkiv. This is the northeastern portion of Ukraine. Over the past few days, Russian troops crossed the Ukrainian border, occupied a number of villages. Ukraine has spent several months fortifying Kharkiv, but storming the city is not how Russia intends to fight. The Russian target this summer is the Ukrainian army, and against this target, it has started to compound its advantages. Now, what Dr. Watling is hitting on here kind of goes back to the very early days of this war, where Russia has talked about a key focus being the demilitarization of Ukraine. Many folks have interpreted that to be the destruction of the Ukrainian military, right? So it's less about taking territory. That is more a byproduct of the destruction of the armed forces of Ukraine. I don't think that's a stretch. That tends to be how we're seeing this war play out in a lot of ways. Uh, but the movement on the front, in this case towards Kharkiv, is a secondary result if you view that destruction of the military as the primary. Now, diving into the first of the two key areas here that Dr. Watling calls out, the first is raw numbers. Shouldn't be a shock. Before this war started, that was an argument that Russia had more men and equipment, more available soldiers, more resources, a larger economy, everything than Ukraine. What he's hitting at in this piece is it's getting worse right now. He says, the Russian forces attacking Ukraine have now expanded to 510,000 troops. This means that Russia has established significant numerical superiority over the armed forces of Ukraine. Heavy losses among Russia's officer corps and more capable units earlier in the war have reduced its capacity to conduct large-scale offensive ground maneuver. The Russians have been limited to conducting platoon and company attacks rather than brigade or divisional operations, meaning that they can rarely decisively overmatch Ukrainian defenders at any one location. With such overall numerical superiority, however, Russia has begun to turn this limitation into its advantage. One pushback I would have on that statement there, this kind of centers around the idea that, look, Russia did lose a lot of senior officers early in the war, and they did expend a lot of personnel from some of their more elite, well-trained units. That's no secret. That does have a cost on any military formation. I don't know that I would still stick to that as the reason that we're seeing smaller scale attacks. I think there's also a big portion of this of this is just how the war is being fought, right? So you can't compile brigades or divisions or corps worth of assets behind the lines without being identified by the other side, right? I mean, we saw this during the Ukrainian counteroffensive in the South this past summer. They kind of telegraphed where they were going to go, but you know, it was really just due to Ukrainian air defense capabilities that those formations weren't struck significantly by Russian assets before they even left the line of departure. It's not really in the cards for either side at this point to mass brigade, division, or higher level elements for some major push through. There's just too many eyes on the battlefield, right? So I wouldn't tie that exclusively to the loss of experienced soldiers and senior personnel. Watling says, they have met with little success, but the breadth of their attacks has fixed Ukrainian troops on the line of contact and forced the armed forces of Ukraine to spread out its artillery, expending munitions to break up successive Russian attacks. This dynamic has prevailed for the last four months. And if you look out over the last four months, we've got areas like Evdivka that, have, that Russia has slowly willed away at and eventually taken. But by and large, you're seeing a lot of kind of static contact right? A lot of drone attacks, a lot of artillery, a lot of deep strikes behind the lines, but not a lot of maneuver. Now, one argument is that that is kind of the direction this war has gone. Another argument that Watling is pointing to here is this is a deliberate action by Russia to kind of tie down Ukraine in as many places as possible. Again, with Russia's advantage, numerical advantage in manpower, equipment, and artillery munitions and bombs and mortars and all that, that's one way they can go about leveraging that advantage, tie down Ukraine in multiple areas of the front. He says, having stretched the Ukrainians out, the contours of the Russian summer offensive are easy to discern. First, there will be a push against Kharkiv, which we are already seeing taking place. Ukraine must commit troops to defend its second largest city, and given the size of the Russian group of forces in this area, will draw in reserves of critical material from air defenses to artillery. And we have started to see that. It's hard to tell exactly what type of equipment has been moved to Kharkiv. 
but there's been reports on both sides from the Russians and the Ukrainians of additional battalions being moved to Kharkiv to help stabilize those lines. He says, second, Russia will apply pressure on the other end of the line, initially threatening to reverse Ukraine's gains from the 2023 offensive, and secondly, putting at risk the city of Zaporozhye. Ukraine should be able to blunt this attack, but this will require commitment of reserve units. So the southern portion of the front, this is again where Ukraine made some some gains this past summer. That would be a bit of a political victory for Russia to be able to say, look at everything Ukraine fought for this past summer. We retook it in X number of days and or weeks. Entirely possible they want to do that. Pushing on Zaporozhye would be a, a significant push, again, just because we haven't really seen that yet, but a, a key piece of infrastructure for Ukraine, and it's hard to imagine uh, that they wouldn't dedicate more resources, again, like they are in Kharkiv, down towards Zaporozhye as well, further, uh, further extending their forces across the front. Watling says that once Ukraine commits its reserves in these directions, the main effort We'll see the expansion of the Russian push in the Donbass. Russia's aim is not to achieve a grand breakthrough, but rather to convince Ukraine that it cannot keep up uh, an inexorable advance kilometer by kilometer all along the front. It's not shocking to hear, again, we're talking about this mixed bag of is the goal the destruction of the armed forces of Ukraine, Ukraine's ability to resist the Russian invaders, or is the goal taking territory? Now we're getting a, a little bit of both of those. Right, So if the Ukrainian armed forces are spread out enough by these small attacks by the Russians all across the front, eventually they will push in certain areas. Watling says specifically the Donbass, not shocking given where the majority of the fighting is already taking place, and that this could wear down Ukraine over the course of this next summer as they're just not able to stop Russia in all of these multiple locations, eventually kind of closing off another portion of the front. Again, it's a prediction that Dr. Watling is making. Moving into the second major aspect here, talks about air defenses and the shortage of air defense munitions in Ukraine. He says, compounding the challenge for the Ukrainian military is the deterioration of its air defenses. The depletion of Ukrainian tactical surface-to-air missile systems has already allowed the Russian Aerospace Forces, VKS, to make their presence felt, delivering hundreds of glide bombs against Ukrainian positions each month. Able to strike behind Ukrainian lines, the Russians are using them to bombard and thereby depopulate Ukrainian towns. This fixes the armed forces of Ukraine forward, defending positions for as long as possible, even as the tactical situation deteriorates. And th- we've seen this play out, right? The number of videos of glide bomb attacks taking place all across the front has spiked in recent weeks and months. And it's not, this is not just some brand new technology that Russia was able to implement. They, it is relatively new, especially the mass production of these glide bomb kits, but it coincides with a decrease in Ukraine's air defense munitions, which has allowed the Russian aircraft to push further and further closer to the front, right? So the big difference with the glide bombs is that they're able to release them significantly behind the front, still in Russian airspace, to target areas inside of Ukraine. But as Ukrainian air defenses have proven uh, less and less robust, they've lost some of these munitions and they're not able to resupply them. The Russian Air Force is pushing further and further, again, striking further inside of Ukraine. Watling says that prior to the full-scale invasion, Russian forces had long envisioned a reconnaissance strike complex, allowing their troops to accurately detect and destroy targets behind the front lines. For much of the war so far, this aspiration has been curtailed by robust Ukrainian air defenses. Now, however, Ukraine is having to save its surface-to-air missiles to deter Russian jets. The result is that Orlan-10 UAVs are now roaming far and wide over the front lines. We talked about this in a video just a couple months ago when seemingly out of nowhere, we saw multiple Ukrainian HIMARS, air defense assets, and helicopters struck significant distances behind the front. We hadn't really seen that since the opening days of the war. And the reason for that, one of the major reasons for that, and talked about in that video, is Russia likely has the ability to push some of these drones further and further into Ukrainian airspace to identify these real-time targets. Because any one of those items, you know, air defense assets, mobile air defense assets like a NASAMS or a Patriot, the HIMARS and helicopters, those are going to move, right? They're not going to sit in a location for a long period of time. So you need real-time eyes on target to be, be able to identify Uh, provide the location and send that back to a firing unit. We've seen a significant uptick in that in recent months. What Watling is pointing to here is that is a direct result of the shortage of air defense munitions. He says, as SAM coverage shrinks, the Ukrainian military will face a very hard trade-off. It can continue to group air defenses around critical national infrastructure, such as power stations, or can move them forward to protect the front. The persistence of Russia's long-range strike campaign means that not only is the front being stretched laterally, 
but it is also being extended in its depth. What he's getting at there is as we see the Ukrainian forces spread out further and further across the line, right now they're having to defend and push back in Kharkiv in the north, all the way down around Kherson in the south, uh, while they're extending left and right, if you will, along the front. The SAM shortage has, a lot, has, has forced Ukraine to make a decision of do they move some of these assets that are further west in around population centers, do they move those closer to the front to help protect their troops because there's limited availability and they can no longer, as he's presenting here, they're no longer able to fully protect the entirety of the Ukrainian territory and they're going to have to make hard decisions about where those critical uh, air defense systems are allocated. He says there's a direct correlation between the speed of supply from Ukraine's international partners of artillery ammunition and air defense interceptors and the speed of deterioration at the front. So long as the armed forces of Ukraine lack sufficient means to blunt Russian attacks along its front, Russia be able, will be able to force Ukraine to commit reserves and then exploit the axes left with insufficient troops and equipment. In other words, so long as Ukraine lacks material, Russia will begin to compound its advantages. When you really break that down, it, it's nothing crazy, right? As Ukraine runs out of men and equipment, Russia's advantages increase is kind of what he's saying there, but pointing directly to the Western partners, the international partners, providing artillery ammunition and air defense systems. So I do think it's notable here that what he talks about, and we're going to hit on this again here in a second, is this is not Watling saying that they're going to be able to stop the Russian offensive or that they're going to be able to retake territory necessarily. He says this is going to, as the ammunition flows in, it will slow the, the deterioration at the front. It will slow the Russian advance is kind of what he's hitting at here, hinting at here. Not stop, not reverse, but at the very least, slow. So in terms of what this means going forward, Watling didn't just doom post this whole thing about how it's all negative for Ukraine. He does talk about some, some positives and what they need to do to reverse this trend in the coming months. He says, turning the present dynamic around is up to Ukraine and cannot be resolved by its international partners. Unless the armed forces of Ukraine expands in size, it will continue to be overstretched. The armed forces of Ukraine must not only replace losses in its existing units, but also raise enough units to manage the rotation on and off the line. Now, this is timely because just a couple days ago, the Ukrainian new, new Ukrainian conscription law passed. It's going to, among other things, lower the age from 27 to 25, and it should increase the number of personnel eligible for military service all across the country. I don't know that it's necessarily going to fill all of the gaps, but it is a step in the right direction. So I think it's a key component here. We spend so much time talking about all of the military aid that's going to come in, that military aid doesn't mean anything if Ukraine is running out of troops. And in order to make sure they don't run out of troops, Ukraine needs to expand who they are pulling into the armed forces, and that is a step that they have just taken. And then in wrapping up here, Watling says the outlook in Ukraine is bleak. However, if Ukraine's allies engage now to replenish Ukrainian munition stockpiles, help to establish a robust training pipeline and make the industrial investments to sustain the effort, then Russia's summer offensive can be blunted and Ukraine will receive the breathing space it needs to regain the initiative. Now, I want to spend a minute on this piece here. It's at the very end of the article, but it's really important how he phrases some of this. Right? It's a much more cautious approach than we've seen, not necessarily from Watling, but from a lot of Western analysts over the course of the last 18 months. Leading up to that summer offensive last year, there's a lot of talk about getting into Crimea or splitting the Russian lines in two and liberating all of the territory that Russia had, had retaken. What Watling is saying instead is if all of these things go well, if Ukraine gets the munitions they need, if the Western partners step up and provide the right munitions on time, you know, in a timely manner, and that Ukraine increases the size of their armed forces and, and, and increases the flow through the training pipeline to get more troops to the front, if all of that happens, then maybe Ukraine can blunt the Russian offensive. Not roll it back, but stop it. And stopping it then would open the door for Ukraine to have some breathing room to retake the initiative at some point in the future. I think it's much more measured of an approach, if you will, than kind of the overly optimistic that we've seen, honestly, from both sides, uh, dating back to the early days of this war. But again, I think pretty interesting assessment from Dr. Watling here, an incredible resource when trying to understand what's going on in this war. I will link his profile on Twitter as well as this article in the description below if you want to check those out. I'll also link our Substack in the description below. Substack's like a mix between a newsletter and a website. The majority of the content on that site is free. We've got articles, audio articles, podcasts, and more. 
uh, not just from me, but from a group of professional seasoned analysts diving into subjects that they're very, very knowledgeable about. So we're talking about things like the history of China and why China is acting the way they are today on the world stage, uh, what's going on with Georgia and the protests there, uh, as well as Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, Hezbollah, Yemen, and, and quite a bit more, if interested, all in the description below. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.